Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. I'm not satisfied when I learn something new unless I share it forward. And so we created this podcast to continue that, to share forward the wonderful people we get to meet and most importantly get to learn from and make our lives richer and better. Together we'll cover the human experience. And for me, the human experience is foundational in the idea of relationships. The topics will be far reaching, but common element you'll see here is it's all about relationships. So I invite you to join us on this journey. Come experience it with us, share your thoughts and ideas, and become part of our community. We'd love to have you. Cynthia, you're an amazing person. Cynthia Covey Haller is an author, teacher, speaker. Uh, you have a passion for volunteering and leadership. You are a big member of your community and uh, and and play a leadership role in I think everything that you do. Uh, you've contributed to several books and articles, and most re- recently co-writing uh, "Live Life in Crescendo." I just love the title of that book of your book, uh, and and the fact that you did it with uh, with your dad posthumously, having worked with his work and the work that you've done with him over the years is an amazing sub story. Uh, I hope we get to, uh, but living life in crescendo is about how to live your best life regardless of age or circumstance. And it's all about uh, taking uh, taking responsibility for your own happiness and for the happiness of the people around you. And I think there are so many lessons in here and so many parallels to what we think about, Cynthia, what we uh, write about here at Flowers. Uh, so it's a ju- just an absolute treat to speak with you. And I, I got to speak with your brother uh, just a, a, maybe a, a couple of months ago now with his very successful best-selling book. I mean, what's it like to be one of the Covey siblings if you don't have a book? <laughs> so one of the younger ones said that the other day. And he said, gosh, I feel like a loser. I haven't written a book yet. <laughs> <laughs> and they were seven years old. So of course they should. <laughs> That's right. I said, no, look at all the other things you're doing. No, it's it's great. We um, we have a wonderful family. We're not a perfect family. We're a, There's nine of us. I'm the oldest of nine. But um, our mom and dad somehow juggled a great relationship with each of us. Being the oldest of nine, being one of nine, <laughs> never mind the oldest of nine, and those of us who are the oldest of uh, of uh, children can recognize the special <laughs> responsibilities that come with that. We usually become babysitters by about nine or ten years old, right? It's true. I'm called the mother hen in my family. So I take care of the brood, and now that my parents are both gone, I, I'm trying to try to help the family stay organized, but there's great siblings. They're my best friends. My wife and I are friends with uh, another family. There are four boys and the oldest of which is uh, a wonderful young man where they're close, we're close to. And he describes it as there were three adults and three kids. (laughs) And sometimes that's how it felt in my family. I I felt I was in the adult group. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, my motto was you have to, uh, you have to be responsible. You don't have to be mature. (laughs) <laughs> if you get too mature, then it's not any fun anymore. But- Cynthia, tell us about the idea for the book, Living Life in Crescendo. I love the term, I'd lo- and I'd love to hear a little bit about where the title came from and how the idea came to uh, to uh, meld it together, your work with the work that you did with your dad and the work that your dad did. Of course, a, a minute on, on your dad. Your dad is, I think, probably the most successful author in what we'd call the uh, a personal development space. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I, I think I heard is sold 40 million copies. 40 million copies, it's 33 years old. So I, it's almost 33, so that's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's still going, still selling. It's beyond amazing. And it's had such an amazing impact on so many lives, including my own. And I, I told your brother, Stephen, that when we chatted recently, that I remember uh, the, the the great treat I had of seeing your dad present in person. I think it was in Las Vegas. And I just hung on every word he had to say. And so he's been a huge influence on my life, but I bet an even bigger influence in your life. <laughs> so you're growing up, the oldest of nine children. Your dad is this amazing man. Uh, you live in this amazing community. Uh, uh, is your family all uh, Latter-day Saints? 
Yes, they are. Uh -huh. So that 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 adds a, a, a layer of community on top of what we normally expect. That's true. Uh, that's and, true. and that and it's a, a a very. I've always been intrigued by the 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 handful of people I have who are LDS because they just are very special people. I mean, they wear on a sleeve the idea of community and service, and the fact that uh, as part of your upbringing. Uh, in your in your community in your church, uh, there's this emph emphasis on a year of service, uh, going to, to work in communities around the world. And uh, I know uh, uh, I'm fond of uh, and a fan of Mitt Romney, and to him hear him and his kids that I've gotten to know talk about how their year of service has impacted their life. It's made me a fan of the idea of a year of service as a, a thought and idea for our country, that. I think everyone should do a year of service in the United States of America, whether it's in uh, the military or it's in Teach for America or it's another some other kind of community service. But the idea of people coming together from all circumstances, being stripped of their their uh, privilege, their circumstance, their their challenges, and put together to do something for a common good, I just feel like it would serve our nation well. And culturally benefit our our uh, our nation, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that, Cynthia. Because you grew up in an environment where that was expected and done, and it, it greatly contributes to your community and to you as an individual. Your your thoughts on that idea? Yeah, wouldn't we have a different world, Jim, if everyone served for a year in some capacity to help other people? And that's wonderful. Um, uh, service was is a, was a big part of my upbringing. I actually served in um, Ireland. I went to Dublin, Ireland for it, for a year and a half, and it was fantastic. It was life changing. And one of the main um, important things that we learned growing up, and that we were always taught, is that life is about contribution, not accumulation. It was one of my father's ideas for this book in in Living in Crescendo, is that. The main through every age and stage of your our lives, we need to look to contribute to other people, to bless them in ways that are needed in our community. Um, and we all know what they are. We can look around us and see things in need, even in our own families. We can see addictions. We can see uh, poverty and great, you know, great struggles for so many people. And if we're if we're able to extend a hand and and serve. What a blessing to them. And it also, we found it enriches your own life. It's, it just comes right back to you. Anything that you give is, it gives you meaning and purpose and keeps you going. Live Life in Crescendo was my father's personal mission statement, the last 10 years of his life. And I think that was the case because he was speaking in his 60s and 70s and People would come up to him and say, well, how long are you going to do this? <laughs> are you are you going to retire soon? And what are you, you know, are you going to keep speaking? And, and why do you keep going about doing this? And he was dumbfounded. He thought, why would I, why would I stop? I still have passion for, for these principles I'm teaching. I still feel there's a need. He felt that he wanted to. His main goal was to unleash greatness in every person. Every person's potential has such greatness. And so um, he, he, he decided the idea of live life for crescendo. I don't know if you're musical. Are you musical at all, Jim? I, I, I can boogie. <laughs> That's good. That's a good skill. Well, um, we're, we're not so much. My mom had a beautiful singing voice. But the, the sign that my dad chose crescendo, if you've been to a concert, you know what a crescendo is, right? Indeed, Indeed, we do. It just builds in power and energy and majesty, and, and it just fills the arena or wherever you are. It grows stronger. And the opposite uh, sign is diminuendo, which means it, it slows in, in power and energy and strength and loudness, and it, and it fades and it finally stops. Isn't that how most lives end in diminuendo? They would if you don't keep uh, if you don't find meaning and purpose in your life as you age. And that's what a lot of people um, sometimes that uh, at the end of their life, if they don't engage, if they are retired from a job. And in our house, the, the R word was kind of a bad word, retirement, because my father said you can retire for a, from a job or career. 
but don't ever retire from making meaningful contributions in other people's lives. And so the idea that as you get older, in the older age, you actually have more to offer. You have more wisdom, more experience, more time, more money, more influence, more connections than ever before. So why not lend that to a worthy cause, service like we talked about, helping um, where in needs where you see, even in your own family, where if you feel like there's a struggling grandchild or you know of a family member that's estranged, you see a big need in your community for the homeless, wherever you feel uh, uh, that you can fill that gap, that's where you, that you contribute. And as people keep contributing in their life, they, their life goes like this, it expands rather than ends and slows and diminuendo. Such an important lesson, Cynthia, the idea that, you know, I, I, think, I think there's so much education and discussion appropriate around uh, retirement. Here, here's a day we've been celebrating retirement of three people here at Flowers. And like I say, I think at least two of them will go on to uh, accomplish other things that are in service to our communities in special and different ways because they're all smart, very smart, uh, accomplished, yes. But as you say, they have more time, relationships, knowledge, experiences than ever. Right. And for that to go to the beach is such a waste <laughs> when there's so much to be done and so much they can contribute. So the, the using that musical reference of realizing that that's your opportunity to achieve crescendo and it can right. last a long, long time. You can you need to find meaningful things and purposes and causes to be involved in as you age. And that keeps you alive. Uh, there's a doctor, an Austrian doctor, Dr. Selvig, that I quoted in the book that talks about the difference between distress and eustress. And distress is harmful stress where it eats at you and it's, and it's, um, it's, it's harmful to your body. It can cause you to lose sleep and to worry and that type of thing. That part, that dis, that dis, distress is is harmful, but eustress is needed. That's the the useful stress. That's a Greek word. Eustress is for exercises use. the mind. Exercises right. the the yep. And if you and if you sit in front of a TV, you don't stimulate yourself with through books, through music, through other people. Um, and you don't take on projects that maybe cause you a little bit of stress in a way that the, people are depending on you and they're looking to you for guidance. You have to use your brain. That's the use stress that keeps you alive. And Dr. Selvig found that those that don't have use stress in their lives, if they retire and they don't replace it with something, uh, a project, with something to contribute, they don't look at have a goal ahead, then they die prematurely. He called it retirement disease. Yeah. Have you seen that? Have you yeah. seen that in your social life where people retired and they don't have a plan to be active and engaged and contributing and being helpful? I have. And uh, my, my dad was a big believer in that. He, he said, you've got to keep if you retire from a job and career, that's fine. But don't contribute from don't retire from contributing. Keep looking for ways to serve or go to another career, go to another job. I'm thinking of a man I just heard about a little while ago named named Mike Mason. He retired uh, from the FBI. He was the number four man in the FBI. So he was up pretty high. And he um, retired uh, from that. I guess they only go so many years or something. And he said he was sitting at home. He said, now I'm the CEO of my rocking chair. And he said, this did not sit well after, you know, being on the ball and doing all these things. He said, I still had a mind. I still had things I wanted to do. So he looked around in his community in Virginia and saw that his county, Chesterfield County, was down 125 bus drivers. <laughs> and so he said, if I'm going to do something, it's got to be worth my time and my effort and my experience. And so he applied to be a bus driver. And, and when, he, when he put his application in, someone up really high in the company called and said, um, is this for real? Are you, you know, you've got to be the most, if you get this job, the most overqualified bus driver in America. And he said, we've got to get past the idea that there are no unimportant jobs. He said, yes, I'm excited. What could be more important than advancing the education in my hometown, in my community? And he said, I continue to advance in my career. Isn't that a great way to think of it? And, he, and the guy, it really they, is. Uh, well, 
boy, imagine that Mike Mason, uh, number four in the FBI, who could have a more <laughs> pressure packed, important role in the criminal justice system. And he says, oh, there's something else I can do that's meaningful, too. It's meaningful. And the, and the interviewer said, well, you can't you don't think this is important as being in the FBI, do I? And that's when he said, yeah, there's no one more important jobs, no one important. Uh, this, our, our school children are so important. I'm investing in education. And um, so he, he he drives the school bus as the most overqualified man in America, but he's contributing. He's giving back. I bet. <laughs> Cynthia, tell me about Pablo Picasso and what he said and how it became the mission statement for this this work, the compilation of your efforts and the work that your dad had done in his later years. How, how did Pablo Picasso contribute here? It's, it's a, it was a surprising quote that we found from Pablo Picasso. Uh, my mom loved Picasso, actually. When my dad came home from a business trip one time and went to bed really late and the lights were off, he woke up the next morning and all of Picasso's <laughs> pictures, frames, uh, prints were all, you know, he woke up and it was the blue period <laughs> right in front of him. And he's like, what is this? <laughs> my mom said, oh, I'm into Picasso right now. But Picasso wrote, uh, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And that's what- How simple, how beautiful, how poignant. It really is. The meaning is to find your gift. And um, my father taught that we each have unique work to do. We each have important things that only you can contribute. My brother told me about your great um, company, your flowers, and I know you have other companies that uh, David and Harry and things. I know you're involved in a lot of things that have meaning. And maybe we'll talk about that later with the caregiving and giving back. But, um, you know, everyone has your your relationships, the things that you have to offer. You all have a certain, everyone has a certain mission. And Dr. Frankel taught that we don't invent our missions. My dad loved Victor Frankel and always quoted him. And he said, we don't invent our missions. We detect them. So we detect them within ourselves. That sounds like it would imply that there's a, a higher mission, oh. a higher calling for each of us. And it's yeah, there. Yeah. It's our job to find it, not to create yeah. it. It's our job to find it, find what, you know, to think to yourself, what am I good at? What am I, what am I passionate about? What are my skills? What are my abilities? You don't have to be rich or famous or, or really talented to make a difference. It's just looking around, seeing a need and responding. The holidays can be hectic, but Harry and David makes it simple to send something special to the people I love. My auntie out west can get her sweet and savory fix. My brother gets a Christmas brunch. And my favorite client can have a banquet in a box. Spread joy this year with Harry and David. You talk about the crescendo mentality. And I, and I just, I love the idea of crescendo. I love the idea of there's two ways you can end your life. And one of them is crescendo. And isn't that the better way? And I was struggling. I was met with a younger man, midlife fellow, and he was saying, you know, it's a luxury of the well off that they could have these crises about what to do with their lives. He said, because of a bunch of different circumstances, he has uh, a parent to care for, which is uh, quite a burden. Uh, he has a family because of some career missteps and, and happenstance. Uh, he's struggling financially. Uh, and he said, uh, I don't have the luxury to sit back and say, what's my mission? How can I, how can I, uh, I I'm just struggling to keep my nose above water. And uh, I don't have the luxury of time to be worried about what my mission is or how am I giving to others? And he was dark about it. How would that give him a, a chance to reflect and change his point of view? Well, I would say, you know, he's his unique mission right now is serving his family. That's the most important role in this book. We, uh, Crescendo, we're defining that success is not how society defines it. Uh, that is um, secondary greatness. That is, um, you know, money and possessions and prestige and things that matter to society, how the world would measure success. But in with the crescendo and mentality in mind, we're defining it as working to be successful in your most important roles. And it sounds like this man, his most important roles are being a caregiver, you said to a parent, helping a, a, another family member with a really bad setback and a, a struggle. What if he uh, saw himself as, as, a, you know, as a, a faithful son, 
um, that, that's his most important role as a caregiver to that parent that's struggling. What greater thing could he be doing right now? He's living in crescendo by doing it. My father said, if you want to make small changes in your life, work on your attitude. But if you want to make big and primary changes, work on your paradigm. And so this book is suggesting that to adopt the crescendo paradigm, which means at every age and stage that we're in, and through setbacks and through stagnant times, through challenges, that you have a choice to decide how you're going to respond to what life's thrown at you. You can choose to live in crescendo, which means to work it out, to, um, to use your initiative and make things happen. To This man is making life wonderful for his parent. He's taking care of a need. He's helping uh, somebody else through a setback. That's an important role. Society would, wouldn't say he's being successful. Um, perhaps he doesn't have money or influence or anything. But what would be more important than what he's doing right now? And so it's kind of a mindset. It's like a pair of glasses that you put on, a crescendo mentality, a paradigm, a new way of looking at everything, deciding I have a choice to make right here. I can, I can, I have a good attitude. I can help with my parent. I can help this person move on. I can be a mentor. I can be a bridge for them to get to a better place. And I life will be better again. The second half of the title is your most important work is always ahead of you. And so this man's life isn't over. I would say to him, take advantage of your role, your most important role right now, be successful in it and help the other people have happy lives and things will keep expanding for you. Look for opportunities. You know, I read your book, Living Life in Crescendo. And as you just mentioned, the subtitle is your most important work is always ahead of you. It made me wish in the last page, there was a red button. And there was a red button that this fellow the, who I referenced to you, who I spoke with recently, and I underserved in our conversation. If, if there was a button he could push and say, there's someone on your right shoulder and someone on your left shoulder. And the person on your left shoulder is saying, yeah, you have it terrible. You're not making enough money. Your family doesn't appreciate you. Your mom, who you're caring for as a caregiver, doesn't appreciate it. She's not expressing us thanks to you. Everything's miserable. You're right. You should be miserable. And the person on the right hand shoulder says, as you just said, and you stated throughout the book, you can change your own paradigm. And it's a lens in your glasses and it's looking forward, not looking back and not looking, oh, look at what my next door neighbor has or look what my uh, brother-in-law has. Look at the gifts I have. I'm changing someone's life, even if they can't appreciate it or express it. I know in my heart and in my soul, I'm making a difference in their life. And I'm setting an example for my children. And some days I can, I'm hoping to, to pay it forward. But to have that red button if people yeah. could get that uh, muddy outlook and paradigm shifting outlook it would be such a gift. And so many people need it, not just once in their life, but on a regular basis. But I think what you do here in living life in crescendo is give everybody access to their own red button. I hope so. Uh, we go through four different stages of life and there's, there's probably a lot more, but we just took on, the midlife stage, for, for for example, for the beginning, maybe you feel you're stuck in a rut. Um, there was a, a principal that was overweight. He weighed almost 400 pounds. He loved teaching. He loved his school, but he could hardly walk down the hall. And he decided, you know, he was his doctor told him he was going to die within a couple of years. And he decided to take control of his life and thought, if I have, I have a vision for the school, but I can't carry it out because I have these issues. I'm I'm stagnant and I'm, I'm not healthy. And he worked, he did what he could to, he started doing Weight Watchers, he started running, he started getting in shape, lost 150 pounds. His, his people around him noticed him losing, noticed healthy choices they were giving at lunch, uh, gym, more exercise. They started all doing the same, they got healthy. Well, 150 pounds later, he's, he's leading the school and he's where he wants to be and he's, He's, a, he's using his initiative and his, what my dad called R&I. Use your R&I and make it happen. Resource, resourcefulness and initiative. Resourcefulness and initiative. And as kids, we kind of hated hearing that <laughs> because you want to blame other people for what happens and you don't want to take responsibility. 
But uh, we would come home from school and say, my science teacher is so boring. I can't get anything out of my class. And I'm I'm flunking my class because my, it's my science teacher's fault. He's just a bore. And my dad would say, use your R&I and make it happen. We're like, dad, and what he meant by that is, you know, you can talk to him. You can ask him for more help. You can get a tutor. You can you can read, do your own reading. You just make it happen. It's up to you to get the good education. Can't blame it on your teacher. And so he would, when we'd complain, he'd just say, "Use your R and I, make it happen." And we we joked that we could go to my mom, and my mom would kind of um, take our side and let us complain and blame other people sometimes. <laughs> so we had a good mix. He'd say, "Oh, that teacher that need to improve," and and things. So if we wanted our heart massage, we'd go to our mom. But if we wanted the truth, we'd go to our dad, <laughs> and he'd say, "It's up to you. Take responsibility." So I think that that's the midlife stage that that is like George Bailey. He thought he wasn't very successful. Remember in A Wonderful Life? Sure. He was a failure because he hadn't traveled. He didn't have money. He, you know, he hadn't become an architect and done all these things. But yet when he was taken out, when the, the angel said, OK, it's like you've never been bored. Um, he later said, you see what a big hole it leaves because you weren't there. And he realized he was important to this town. It became yes. Potters, Pottersville and Bedford Falls was so wonderful before because he was there. And so society would say, yeah, you're not successful. His brother at the end toasts him to the most successful, the biggest guy in town, which was true, George Bailey. So so we, d- we define success. Um, maybe you are more successful than you realize that you are. Maybe you have primary um, greatness, not secondary, which is the the prestige and all the things that society says, primary greatness is being true to your most important roles in life. And most of those focus on the family or on community work and humanitarian efforts. And then the second perspective in the midlife is if you are in a rut, if you are stagnant, if you have a bad relationship with your boss or your spouse, use your R&I, make it happen. It's up to you to, to change it. You can choose. You can choose going down the same path and self-destruct or you can pivot and recreate your life. The last thing I'd like to focus on with you, Cynthia, is something that's a, a theme throughout your book. And we've been doing a lot of work around here, particularly in our Harry and David brand. Harry and David is a, a wonderful hundred year old brand. It's a, we grow our own product. We're famous for our pears and we grow peaches and apples and grapes and kiwis. And we make all these wonderful p- food products. I've got to tell you, Jim, my, my mother loved Harry and David. Our, my brother would give it to her every Christmas, and it wasn't Christmas until she got a big thing of 12 pears, and they were the best pears. And she's very generous in sharing, but she would not share those. We had to sneak them because they <laughs> looked forward to it all year. <laughs> so we, we love your products. <laughs> oh, it's so, so nice to hear that, Cynthia. Thank you for saying so. But Harry and David, the group there has decided that they want to focus on a particular community that you've been a part of. That community is a community of caregivers. And so much about caregiving, there are, I, we think we've read that there are 54 million people in the U.S. who self-identify as, as caregivers. Talk to me about the role of caregivers and what is important about the attitude of caregivers. You were, you and your uh, your siblings, you being the uh, the... Uh, the mother hen of nine, uh, you, both of your parents required care at the end of their life, your mom, for a dozen years. And how did you approach the idea of being caregivers and how important is attitude? Caregivers are, talk about your most important role. If you are if you are in this stage where you are caring for your parent, what greater thing could you be doing than giving back to a parent that took care of you your entire life growing up? And what a chance to pay, to pay back. Somebody once said, it's funny how uh, one mother can take care of six kids, but six kids can't take care of one mother. <laughs> you know, because people say, oh, it's so hard. My mom can't do anything. I have to help her. I have to do this and that anymore. It's like, welcome to motherhood and now welcome to caregiving. But as siblings, we decided we had both our parents that had that needed care um, at the end of their life. Your dad was as a result of an accident. I think I read that he had a, a bicycle accident and his yeah. ill-fitting yeah. helmet uh, uh, didn't protect him. 
He, he did. But also, Jim, I talk about, and people don't really know this, but we decided to make it public uh, to help other people that struggle with health issues. He developed front temporal dementia at the end of his life, which was incredible to us that he would get this because he always sharpened the saw, you know, sharpened the saw, one of the habits. And they say, yep. if you use your mind, you won't lose it. Well, you know, hereditary genes sometimes have an impact too in there. And so he he struggled with that in the last the last few years of his life, and so uh, between that and our mom in the wheelchair, uh, we had our hands full. But we what we did is I think it's important first to organize and get together as siblings, and and take different roles. My one sister, um, I I was in charge of nurses and the medical, um, taking care of uh, her being attended by different people and getting her to doctors and all that kind of thing. Another sister, my mom still wanted to do things, but it was overwhelming to her. So she was the gift. She took care of her gifts. She wanted to come to a family. As I said, I'm the oldest of nine. Well, there's 55 grandkids, Jim. <laughs> and like, like 55. Uh, and, and what a joy that must be to get together. <laughs> it's really fun and wild. And then like 40 great grandkids. So she still wanted to participate at weddings and showers. So my sister took care of giving, um, getting the gifts for her. So my mom would look really good at a shower. She'd, she'd say, and here's here's a gift from me that my, my sister had purchased. Another sister picked her up all the time and took her to her book club, to her luncheons, to opera, to whatever she wanted to go to because she was in a wheelchair and she couldn't do it. Um, a couple of my brothers, one brother called her every day on the way home from work and talked to her for an hour while he commuted home and what that meant to her and how close they got through, you know, how was your day? What did you do? And how about you, mom? And, and everything. So I think first you got to kind of organize and assign everybody to do different things that can help. And then the, one of the most valuable things we did is one of this, one of our sisters was really into family history. And so she would go when she, when it was her turn, we all rotated going to visit her because there were nine of us. So we tried to visit once every nine days and then stay in touch by phone on the other days. And so this sister would go with a, a reporter and she, her, she just used her phone and she would ask her questions about her life and about growing up and how valuable this is to her to us now. Um, I guess there's an app called Addie, I mean, Otter, O-T-T-E-R. And if you get your uh, someone to speak into it, then you can you can get them to transcribe it. And so yeah. we have all these wonderful s stories of her falling in love with my dad and and starting to become a mother and raising all these kids and the, her community service that she did that that we would just you know you never you never have down if they didn't write it. So that was one of the things she did. And then we we talked about we've got to cherish this time. Because, you know, it, it, it may be hard and it may stretch us, but if we make it a priority, they're going to be gone so soon. It's so valuable for them to feel loved and part of the family when they're struggling. And just think about how we want to be treated when we're at that age. <laughs> you always, they always say your children choose your rest home or choose your what's going to happen to you. And so we decided we want to enjoy this time and really cherish the moments that we get and actually fight to have times to be with mom and dad, you know, to say, no, it's my turn. I Let me take her because, you know, it, pretty soon they're gone and you can never get it back. And so it's a blessing. So of taking advantage of that time with your mom that your brother did to hear her stories and to record those for the next generation. And that, well, just a gift that was for him and for her to be able to tell those stories, share with the siblings. But now for those 55 next generation to hear those stories and to hear those lessons and to realize what they're a part of. Because when you guys get together and you're telling those stories, sharing those stories, those little ears are listening and it tells them they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And that feeling of belonging is critically important to our, our psyche, our well being, and our feeling about relationships. Because we preach here, uh, Cynthia, uh, that success in life is divine divined as you said life isn't about uh contribution life is about contribution not accumulation yeah. and i would say that contribution is about relationships the it's the true. depth and breadth of the relationships you have will define your health and your wealth 
uh, not in a monetary sense, but in the the valuable sense. Uh, and and Cynthia, reading this is such a a great exercise for us all. I expect I'm going to see this on a lot of laps on airplanes because a cross country trip shared with living life in crescendo will be one of the most valuable cross country trips any of us will ever take because the lessons you've learned, the lessons you learned from your dad and with your family and shared with us are such valuable lessons about what's important in life. And it serves as a little red button that we sometimes need. Don't, after you read life, Living Life in Crescendo, don't put it far up on your bookshelf. Keep it on a lower level because every once in a while you should reach it out, reach out, open it up, and just read randomly a chapter because it'll help you hit the red reset button. And don't we all need to do that from time to time? Thank you so much. I'm inspired listening to you, Jim. Uh, you know, I can tell that you create a wonderful family culture with your business. You're mission driven. And my brother told me that, that you that you care about other people and that you're, you're you know, care about different missions of helping them. And what a great contribution you're making and that we can all make in our own small ways, whatever we can contribute to another person, a kind word, like you said, an encouragement and being a mentor to someone that needs a hand up. So thank you so much for inviting me. I, I love being part of your show. What a treat to spend time with you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thanks so much, Jim. I appreciate you inviting me. Enjoy the holiday. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to Celebrations Chatter. You can join our community by reaching out at chatter at celebrations.com. And while you're at it, tell us what topics you'd like us to explore here on the Celebrations Chatter podcast. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to share it forward. <laughs>